hand to the Weiss handout, which will be for next Tuesday. And there is a Paul Sonkin handout, which I think is a week from Wednesday. Or it's Wednesday. We have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week. And these are the handouts. In fact, if you want to pass them around so people don't just take handfuls, take handfuls back home with you and pass them around to your neighbors. Hey, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad you're making all the classes. Oh, good. Oh, good. go back to work sometimes. Terrific. Oh, sure, sure. Very welcome. Okay. Good, good. Terrific. Okay. Timberline and Hyundai. All right. You're just taking that. Bring your cooperative instincts. Who does not have copies of the handout? Yeah, there's a socket one here. Bob Cruz and Andrew White, and they have run out of socket. Looks like we've run out of socket. I think they're going around. I think they're going around. <laughs> involved in value investing are. You ought to have a sense that you want an appropriate search strategy. Where you're going to look that's going to put you on the right side of the train, where you're going to be better informed than the people on the other side of the train, or at least making a more sensible decision. That's the first thing. Second thing is you want an approach to valuation and industry understanding. That is, you want a degree of judgment both about how to process the accounting information and how to think about the context in which the nature of the industry and the sort of economic model of the industry puts that accounting information that leads to superior valuations to the run of the mill performance of your competitors, because this industry is, by its nature, a zero-sum industry. Beyond that, you want to be good and systematic at looking at the collateral information. Are the insiders buying or selling? Have you made this mistake before? Is this an area where somebody with your particular makeup should be competing? And finally, you want to have an idea of how you're going to manage risk. The people you're going to hear from for the next 16 sessions are all the evidence of their performance indicates outstanding at doing all those things, either implicitly or explicitly. I take no credit for that, despite the fact that some of them are actually a product of <laughs> earlier versions of this class. It is their ability to take that basic model and build it into a way they go about investing. <coughs> Nobody, I think, over the last, how many years have you been running a fund? Uh, eight and nine years, yeah. Over the last eight to nine years has done that significantly more successfully than our speaker tonight, who is Lee Lu. He graduated from the business school, went immediately into the business of running a hedge fund, did it first for Julian Robertson with extraordinary success, and has since moved on to doing it for himself and his old professors with even, I have to admit, more extraordinary <laughs> success. But beyond that, I think what you want to pay attention to is how 
basically does he put all these elements together in his own inimitable style. And with that, I, by the way, let me actually say one more thing. The speakers you're going to hear from have very different attitudes towards risk and very different degrees of optimism, which are particular to them and particular to the way in which they do investing. Li Lu's background is having survived as the leader of the Tiananmen Square protests and escaped with his life. In some sense, A, he's very optimistic, and B, after living with that kind of risk, the only thing left to do was run a hedge fund. <laughs> <laughs> I would keep that in mind as you listen to how he goes about dealing with this environment of being a professional investor and having to outperform all the rest of the world. Lee Lu. <laughs> well, what Bruce said about me must be true, because my evidence is my wife actually showed up to listen to me tonight. Now, I can guarantee that does not happen in our home. And, and also, I really felt terrific uh, coming back to this class. I mean, this class, in many ways, is really what made uh, my career. Uh, about 15 years ago, at the time, actually, I wasn't even a student at uh, business school. I was accidentally brought into a lecture, I think, uh, basically part of this class. And uh, the speaker has a funny name that really reminds me of some kind of buffet lunches. <laughs> anyway. In the middle of the speech, uh, listening to Warren, the light bulb kind of just went off, and uh, I figured that I can do something in this uh, business. And of course, at the time, I was a pretty desperate. You know, recently escaped from China. I didn't know anybody, have a very little, uh, you know, connection whatsoever, and didn't have any money. In fact, I was deep in debt, and I was horribly worried about how do I ever make a living in this country. And I really didn't grow up with a capitalist culture either. So, and so in the middle of his speech, I thought, well, <clears throat> what he said uh, about investing really just so different from my perception of a stock market. And, uh, and the more I think I thought about it, the more I thought, well, gee, this may be something that I can do. Now, I suppose that most of you who chose this class, I understand it's very difficult to get into this class. At least it was when I was a student. Um, it's maybe a, kind of a self-selected uh, group of people who are already somehow biased or, uh, towards the value investing. How many of you really consider yourself uh, a value investor or, or more predisposed into value investing? How, how many of you sort of know for sure you're going to be in kind of asset management business? So roughly the same number of people who really want to be in asset management business with sort of a already consider yourself as a value investor. So who can really tell me, what are the one or two things that really sort of defines a value investor from everybody else? Anybody? Yes, Chase. Uh, one of the things that I, that I think about is that the, usually their performance depends on the uh, underlying performance of the business, right. rather than taking multiple expansion and trading into and out of the stock based on sentiment. So in other words, you think that uh, <clears throat> you sort of feel yourself as more of an owner of a business in a sense, and therefore your fortune rises up and down with the nature of the business and how it Things to add, please. Yeah, you, you sort of you, you demand a margin of a safety in a sense. Anybody else? Right. 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 Well, that's pretty summarized. Uh, that uh, there are basically three attitudes streaked out of the uh, teachings of uh, Ben Graham. That a you think yourself as basically not a uh, uh, a paper shuffler in the sense you you, you really think yourself as uh, as owner of the business, and, and b you sort of you know you, you you demand a huge margin of safety when approaching uh, investment. And see that uh, uh, somehow you sort of think everybody else is different. So this this is where the Mr. Market analogy come in. Uh, 
this is three things actually kind of a, a, they all you know come into really coming from one perception, which is you know is you you think yourself as an owner of business rather than kind of a, a, a kind of owner of a piece of a paper, and 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 you own a small piece, and therefore you really don't control the business. And therefore, sort of, is almost self-defense to demand a large margin of safety, because whatever value you perceive, it may not be there because you can't control it. Uh, and then, because you thought you're really owning a business, and therefore you really don't care, you know, if you're owner of business, you don't trade that all the time. And so, therefore, you think that you are somewhat different from just about everybody else in the market participant. But then the question is, if you really feel you're owner of business, why do you want to be the stock market? The stock market is not created for this type of a people. Is that right? The stock market is a created is a fractionalized so that everybody can go in and go out. Is that right? Anybody have a view on that one? Who can tell me that asset you think is really um, kind of managed by value investors? Anybody have any guess? With that kind of a perception we just talked about, there's no real study, <clears throat> but there are a number of attempts of a study, uh, including one actually by a, a professor next door at the law school, a low, uh, uh, a low instinct, yeah, and, and which really kind of put it at roughly under five percent of all asset. That actually is consistent from what we just talked about it. Now, you are really not to the majority. You are actually a very, very minority. And the stock market is really not created for you. It's created for the 95% of all the other people. And that's really where your opportunity is. And that's where your challenge is. So to understand that before you go into management and business is really extraordinarily important. And that's really when I, that's what I first learned when I, when I came here and listened to uh, Buffett. Uh, that's one thing that stick in my mind. And that really sort of helped me to position where I am, because I really know by then what kind of a person I am. I think most of your challenge, especially those of you who really want to end up in the manage, management business, and I'm actually tonight primarily addressed to that group of people. <laughs> Sorry for those people <laughs> uh, that, that, that are not. Uh, you are, your biggest challenge is really to understand whether you are that 5% of the per people or you are the 95% of the majority. And you might think that because of the training, because you do this, you sort of you know, intellectually or theoretically biased towards that small minority group of people. You'll be amazed, you know, how much it would have changed. You know, my career is sort of take a little <clears throat> twist as well. I always kind of run my own fund. You know, part of the time when Bruce sort of mentioned was uh, Julian was really sort of uh, <clears throat> when he invited me to really share off it with him because he sort of invited a whole bunch of fund managers that uh, he invested in and also share, story, uh, share ideas. And that's when I sort of get a much better understanding of how the 95% of other people really operated. And, and <clears throat> you know, it is tempting because you know, why 95% of the people don't do you know, what you guys are here <laughs> try to do? Despite the spectacular success of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, why is that? Anybody have a, a reason? Why is that? Why there's only, yes? Yeah, emotionally is very difficult. But if you think of that, you know, it's very convincing that value investors over a long period of time really have much, much better uh, kind of a returns. You know, you think that's where the money is. You know, even if it's emotionally difficult, you think they wouldn't change it. Any other reason? Right, right. Right, right. We actually are very close to the point. I think that the, the real answer is that's really where the money is. Why that's where the money is? Because the market is really created for those group, those kind of a people, who are really thinking of trading in and out all the time, and therefore, that they will pay attention to the short term, and therefore that if you put up with that requirement, that's really where the asset is going to find you. 
And so as a result, that statistic, despite the huge discrepancy of a performance of that 5% have a spectacular return consistently over a long period of time, 95% of the money or something close to that probably would always reside to somewhere else. And if that's where the money is, you know, most of the people would naturally would end up there. So my first kind of a point I want to leave with you is really to understand who you are, because you will be tested through all this period of time to your future career development that you're going to really have to really face to, 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 to ask yourself whether you're a value investor or you're not a value investor. Now, if for whatever reason that your personality is built to be a value investor, that probably means that you're somehow you know, genetically mutated throughout the, uh, the process of evolution, that A, you're very comfortable being in the minority, which is not really very uh, <coughs> natural to human beings. You know, throughout our human evolution process, the most of us survive because we stick with the group in face of large mammals. That's the only way we can, we can survive. And so it is really over you know, <coughs> tens of thousands of years of uh, evolution, it really you know, deeply ingrained into the, your genes. Uh, but occasionally you will find a small percentage of people really survive despite the fact that they really have a different kind of a gene. It's almost a, through a mutation process that that group of people survived. So that's the first thing you have to really be very, very comfortable. Uh, you know, being very much by yourself. And therefore you would naturally adopt the attitude you're right not because other people agree with you, but because your reason, your evidence are right. It is common sense. But of course, as people said, common sense is the least a common commodity. Most people don't think that way. And secondly, that you would probably spend most of your time truly being an academic researcher instead of a so-called a professional investor. Most of the time you're going to spend as a professional investor as a value investor, not a professional investor, is really to be an academic, to be a researcher, to be a journalist, actually. Uh, to basically be, have insatiable curiosity. To really and try to figure out how just about everything works. Because investing, really, the more you know, <clears throat> the better off you are as an investor. And so you, you just have to be naturally interested and curious just about everything, any kind of a businesses, politics, science, technology, uh, <clears throat> humanity, history, poetry, literature, everything really affected your business, basically. So you almost have to wait, you, you know, that, that, I don't want to scare all people, but you, you don't have to, <laughs> put it that way. It will help you. It will help you. And then occasionally, you would find a few insight that all of those studies that really gave you tremendous opportunities that other people just for whatever reason couldn't deal with. Either psychologically, somebody said, or because of the limitation of the thinking, or because of the institutional imperative of the institution they belong to, all sorts of different reasons. And then you go through your find out is the business, that opportunity you're given, is that cheap? Is the business a good business? Is the management is somebody that I can trust? Either because they're good or because the external checks are sufficient? Um, and what else is missing? And the why this opportunity presented to me? So you go through all those checklists, and you feel comfortable. And then you just have to really go over the last psychological barrier to basically do it. So let's just go through a couple of examples. Unfortunately, what, what, what I'm doing today, you know, I, I no longer talk about what we own. So I pick up a couple of examples of what I owned in the past. You know, I started this business in late 97. And uh, you know, uh, along the way, been through a couple uh, <clears throat> really traumatic events. You know, one is sort of the Asian financial crisis, and then the technology bubble, a couple of different things. But during those period of time, you, you tend to have more interesting opportunities. 
Let's start with, uh, uh, let's go back to 98. So it was a fall in 98. And I tell you, the search that I go through are very simple because I'm interested in all sorts of different business. I usually just get menus. You know, I got hooked to value line while I was a student here. You know, every issue as it comes out, I just, you know, love to read the whole thing from beginning to end because that's really the best uh, kind of education if you want to have an encyclopedia knowledge base and database which you have to. Uh, so just to go through that page after page after page is just enormously helpful. And, and the first thing I always check is sort of the new low list. You know, <laughs> the, the new kind of a low is the book, low is the P, low is this, low is that. That really <laughs> attracts me more than the new high list. Now this actually, I don't have any more of my copies. I get rid of that. So I asked them for reprint and the number is not right. I mean. I was looking more of somewhere around, uh, uh, I think it was a September or something, August, that when the stock was roughly around 28, so this is 46, it was not right. Uh, so it's roughly called that 28 to 30. Now you look at this one, you know, what is the first thing jumps to you? Somebody give me a, a quick read. Yes. Right. High and low change every year. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Oh, it looks like it's just falling off a cliff. Right. Right. Anything else? Now, if you're in investors, you don't really care where it was traded before, actually. <laughs> All I care, and I tell you what I look for, is I first look at the valuation. And if the valuation doesn't fit, I don't even want to really kind of go beyond. So what's, what do we know about the valuation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a good point. And what is the constitution of the book value? So everything, you know, every time you see is a below book value, you want to say, what's in the book? What's in the book? How much is the book? What? Now that's simple. You can just you know call it a twenty-eight, and then you got a what, uh, eleven and a half million shares, roughly three hundred something, low three hundred million. Just do approximate. You don't have to really do all the quick ones, and you'll see where it is. Now the uh, uh, the uh, working capital is almost a three hundred million in a sense, and of course it was the end of the uh, Q three. And in, in retail, what, what what do you know about? Uh, Kind of an end of a Q3 in retail. Is it, this is really where you know your your kind of a quick uh, encyclopedia knowledge really helps you. All retails have built up a huge amount of inventory. The last quarter, so you look at back to the previous years to say what is normal like because they're going to really collect a lot of cash by the end of the year. So you say okay, so it's a 300 million. It's almost the entire book value, roughly 275 million, is in the uh, is in the uh, working capital, everything else cancel each other. And so you probably collect about 100 million cash at the end of the quarter if you look at the other two years. So roughly you got a 200 million liquid asset and plus 100 million of fixed asset. And if you do you know, a little bit more study, you're going to see there's entirely buildings, real estate basically. So 300, and you're trading roughly 300 million. And so 200 million is a, is, is a liquid asset. And then about 100 million is a, is in real estate. So you've got a pretty decent protection on the downside. So what do we know about the earnings, the cash flows? And the ones you want to really pay most attention is basically kind of the, uh, the pre-tax and pre-interest uh, earning, the unleveraged. And you want to compare that with the unleveraged capital that is needed in the business to get you a sense of what kind of business you're having, how much they're making. Give me a quick sense, how much is that? Well, if you're skilled, it shouldn't really take you more than one second to find that out. You got 13% roughly of, uh, of, of operating margins of 800, what, 800, 850 million. So you get roughly, what, 100 million, 110 million. And what is your deployed capital? How much capital is deployed in the business, roughly?
you would have roughly about, let's say, 200 million in, in, uh, in liquid asset, and then about 100 million in buildings, and then the 200 million of liquid asset, probably 100 million is cash. So you roughly have a 200 million deployed capital, and roughly returns about 110 million dollars. So your return on your deployed capital roughly around 50 percent at that point. So that's not a bad business. So you shouldn't really, I mean, you start with, say, you, you, you give a five second look and you say, hey, the business, I don't care, you know, all the other things. The business was trading roughly, you know, read right around the book value. Book value is pretty clean. Uh, is basically consists of, of a tangible liquid asset, working capital, plus, uh, you know, 100 million in real estate. And, uh, and the deployed capital is basically two thirds of that, and and for that two hundred million, you return roughly a hundred million or so, and so it shouldn't be bad business to begin with. So next, you check sort of a, why this whole thing sort of fall apart at that point. Sort of a missing. I mean, whenever you see something like that, you say, "Wow, that's not a bad." You know, if I own the whole business, remember you always sort of think as yourself as a business owner. If I own this business, if I can buy the whole business at this price, you know, you, you probably want to own it. And it's actually it's not a bad uh, name, right? Most people recognize Timberland as a brand, right? So what is the reason at the time? Well, it's turned out that was the height of the Asian financial crisis, that all their competitors, especially Nike and Reebok, see their sales, especially in Asia, uh, falling out of a cliff. And so the whole contingency, sort of all their perils, all the retailers, the shoes, and the international brand, anything that has exposure to Asia, all fall apart. But what else is, is going on? So, so you, try, you try to check you know, what other people are thinking about this. <clears throat> you, know, you, 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 you may not really listen to their advice, but you want to really know what other people are looking at. So you check to see whether there's any analyst report. It turns out there's no analyst report. Nobody covered this. Well, for a company that's doing about a billion dollars in sales, it's, you know, it's a reasonable company, it's a big brand. So why nobody kind of a cover about this? Any possible reasons you can speculate? Yes? They don't have data on the balance sheet, maybe they don't go to capital markets, and so they don't see, there's no mail that's going to sell the product. Which is good or bad for you? Uh, for an investor, it's good. Fabulous for you. Yeah. Fabulous for you. And you go back to, say, 10, 15 years. The good thing about value line is you go back to 10, 15 years, and you see whether they ever really need to that money. What did you find in the business over the last whatever years? It's been growing. <clears throat> the profitability has improved dramatically over the recent years, but has always been pretty profitable. And therefore, their need for financial market is very limited. Any other reasons? What's the ownership structure? Yes. It's a, it's a family -owned yes. What do you mean by family owned? Like the family they own 40% of it. How much vote they control? Like they have a 100% vote, basically, 98%, right? So immediately that turn off a whole bunch of people. And then you see what, you know, how the investor has been basically reacting to them in the past. You can do a quick. Uh, kind of a data uh, search, and this is really why I, you know I say that a, a, uh, a, a investor should really be investigative a journalist because we have a journalist here. I'm sure if if I ask the journalist look at this question, you know the you know, the first thing you would say would it go through all of this question I just asked, and pretty easily you can find all the answers and very quickly. And so you've got to have a very active, very curious mind. And you just can't, wouldn't really satisfy with any bogus answers. Otherwise, you can't really be in this business. So you go and you find there's actually a whole bunch of a different shareholder lawsuit. Now you have an owner who owns 40%, owns an almost 100% of the vote. And most of the shareholder doesn't have a vote. And you have no analysts cover them. And there are a whole bunch of a shareholder lawsuit. So immediately, that if you don't know anything about the business, if you are the 95% of the other investor, what conclusion you would draw? What would be your conclusion? 
if you were kind of you know a normal mutual fund or a hedge fund trading oriented uh, 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 investment manager, what would you say to this situation now that you find all this information? Please. Maybe that there is not enough uh, good information to really touch the stock. Yep. So therefore, it doesn't work to own it. Right. To risk it. Anything else? Yes. I probably think, I mean, uh, the problem is temporary. Right. And uh, the stock is small case, not liquid. Right. So I may not put my money in. Right. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Anything else? You guys are not skeptical enough. Well, would you really worried about that, uh, <clears throat> that management might be milking money from the company? Might be manipulating their books? Because they control everything, there is virtually no, uh, there are virtually no constraints on what they do. And the fact there are a whole bunch of a lawsuit that tells you they complain about something, right? So what do you do next? What do you do next? Well, yes, that's one thing. Anything else? What? Absolutely. You download every single piece of the document of the court cases, every single case, and read them from page one. And that's why I was saying that if you don't have a curious mind, if you just, if you just want to do it because you want to make money out of it, the chances are you're not going to do this. You have to really figure that, I just, you know, I'm just so curious. They say, what's happening to this? This doesn't add up. And you have to dig every single thing. And so you read everything, as I did. The first part, it takes you less than you know, a couple minutes. You look at that one, you say, that's really what I want to do. All the questions you read leads you to all of that. So upon I can possibly find all the cases I can find. You know, all the cases really come down to really one thing. Actually, it's basically one complaint, it's just multiple filings. Um, that, you know, somebody really say, well, <clears throat> they used to provide some guidance, and they didn't deliver, and the investor get pissed off. And so the owner also get pissed off. You can, you know, vividly see his defense. You can get a sense of his personality by reading those documents. He said, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to talk to the street. I'm not going to give any guidance. I don't need a damn of a dollar from anybody else. The business is wonderful. OK, so that removed a big cloud. So the next thing, what do you do? Well, if they really run this, uh, run this way, the, the next question is, OK, maybe they're not crooks. But are they good managers? How do we know that? Are they decent people? How do we know about that? How do we go about to find that? What do you do? Sure. Anything else you can do? How do you know his personality? Yes. You try and uh, call his neighbors. Uh, <laughs> Good idea. Great. What do you call? What do you tell the neighbors? I tell them the truth. I'm an investor. How, uh, yeah. uh, I'm concerned. Well, it's one of the markets concerns. Maybe the management may not be honest, and they like your opinion. <laughs> well, what if you just say, "Go to hell"? Johanna? Well, I'm uh... Most people will tell you go to help. <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> but it's a nice try. Anything else? Yeah. That's right. There was no Google back then. <laughs> but that's a good idea. Now, you want to, the point is, you've got to really go. You know, as, as, as again, again, you know, just happen to have a journalist here, but I always view this job as investigative a journalist. Most of people who have built businesses also have a big personality, have a history you can go to audit, have left a trail of evidence of what kind of person they are, and what they have done, how they deal with the different situations. It is not that difficult, but you have. To most professional managers wouldn't really consider that as a part of the business. But I'm telling you, you're the 5%. If you end up to be the 5%, maybe you're not. 
But if you try to be that 5%, that's what you do. You go to see their community. You go to the church or synagogues. And you go, you know, you go visit everybody. You, you sort of get yourself to be part of that. And you introduce yourself to all their friends and families and neighbors. Don't just call them. Go there. Spend a few weeks there. It's worth it. It's worth it. Just to spend as much time as you can possibly be to try to find him. Find what he has done to his community. What does neighbors and friends tell about, I mean, say about him? That tells you more about this personality. And you want to find the family dynamics. This fellow actually only graduated high school, never really went to have a college. Relatively simple guy, but a nice, decent guy. Has been very philanthropic. Go to synagogues, but not <coughs> terribly devoted. <coughs> but the more interesting thing, he has a son who actually went to business school as well. It was actually my age at the time. It was in the uh, <coughs> mid-30s, early to mid-30s. And at the time, already assumed to be a COO of the company. So I did all of the things I suggest to all of you. I did further, <coughs> and I find what this son's, all the board of the father and the son's on. And I find one of the board the son was on actually is run by a friend of mine. So I invite myself to be on the board. <laughs> so I joined on the board along with the son, and we become very close friends. And then I really know what's going on in that family. It's turned out this is one of the most admiring family I've ever met. They are people of the highest integrity. They're wonderful. And they also happen to be brilliant businessmen. So after all of that, the stock actually still trading right around 30s. And so that's sort of, you kind of answer it. You sort of know, you know, did I miss anything? You sort of say, probably not. I didn't miss anything. The other 95% just don't know. Or their industry imperative does not allow them to do anything about it. So what do you do at that point? What do you do? Buy. How much you want to buy? Let's suppose they have $100. What? <laughs> what? How much is that? 200 OK. Well, I like to talk to this class because you guys are not polluted yet. Now, if you go to join a fund, the first thing people would tell you is, oh, gee, don't do anything more than 25 basis points. And then you go with maybe 50 basis point, you do 1%, that's 100 basis point. They use a basis point. So every number sounds big. You know, boy, we're going to do 50 basis point. That's a big deal. <laughs> that's what it's like. That's what it's like. So keep your innocence. Because right now, what you're thinking is the common sense. Think about how much effort you put in to get this damn thing right. Think about how good it is. You have virtually no downside. You're trading roughly about five times. And the next thing I did is I actually went to all the different stores to see why in the last few years the margin improved substantially. It turned out there was a fad going on, in the, in the, uh, especially in the inner cities, that all the little kids want to have you know, the Timberland shoes and jeans. And boy, the things that you know, all the store manager tell you, they couldn't really get enough stock. And you look at how much of their international business, how much is actually in shoes and in Asia, less than 10. What they make out of that, less than 10, 10% out of the 10% of the 27%. So you calculate all of that, you say that all of them are gone, you're losing money. So what? It reduced your earnings by less than 5%. So. I put a shitload of them. <laughs> Anybody know what happens afterwards? In the next two years? I mean, you guys all have the internet. You can check right away. Really? You should do that. 
You should have. Why do you want to listen to all this shit? <laughs> you just do whatever you want to do. As I said, you know, you're right not because other people tell you to or agree with you. You're right because you need to do that. You need to check on that. All of those things should come to you in no less than five minutes. Otherwise, you're just not a good analyst. If you're not a good analyst, you'll never be a good investor. Seriously. So you have to at least technically train yourself to be very, very proficient with all of that. Well, the next two years, this damn thing went up seven times. And the truth of the matter is, during all those time, it was propelled by earnings. And so you, during all this time, you, did, you still did not have any risk. It's not like you're hiding, you know, writing some technology company after they double, tripled. You expose yourself to a huge amount of attack. It was never more than 15 times earnings. Never. But if you trade it from five times to, you know, to 15 times, and the earnings been growing in that period of time 30% a year, I mean, that add up. That add up. And the other took over as a CEO, and he had entirely different ideas about how to run a company. He was very articulate. He's one of the most articulate person I ever met. Stu is. So he doesn't mind to talk to general, uh, analysts. He initiates uh, not uh, earning guidance, but analyst meetings. And the first meeting, guess who, uh, you know, how many people showed up? It was him, me, and another analyst. Three people. <laughs> Three people. And the last analyst, when I sort of went kind of, you know, somewhere in 2000, the end of 2000, the room is just absolutely filled with nearly 50, 60 people. A major street breaker house kind of initiated some kind of a coverage. So that's no, I know when I have to sell. So I sold everything. Anyway, let's go back to say, hey, you know, time uh, kind of flipping. This is sort of a year and a half ago. Yeah. Did you worry about what happened between 1994 and 1996, in particular 1996? Because that's really when the lawsuit occurred. <laughs> they, they did have a period of a time. And what happened then? Well, they do have a misstep at that point uh, because their product wasn't right. And they, they build their business really on the reputation of this kind of waterproof. Uh, they're the first guy who really come up with this concept of waterproof. And so they did, uh, you know, sort of mix, they send mixed signals of both waterproof to shoes and non waterproof to shoes. And, and in marketing, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. And it confused the market, and it confused the integrity of their claim, and, and, and they suffered. But even with that year, the revenue pretty much has still gone up. I mean, they have a one year of a blemish. Most of the time, they have executed their business quite brilliantly. Yes? Yeah, when you have the close relationship with the son of the company, uh, the owner, does that trigger the inside the trading company? It does. <clears throat> That's why I didn't really buy anything afterwards. You don't have to. You already bought everything at 28. <laughs> you, know, you know, when they go up, you, don't, you just have to sit your ass on it. Don't have to do a damn thing. That's a good thing about really buying a good business. The business take care of yourself. I mean, as Chase said, you're riding up and down with the <clears throat> with, with with the strength of the business. And you, yes. How, how much time did you spend doing your due diligence before you bought your? Actually, no more than a couple of weeks. I mean, all of those surprisingly it doesn't take all that long. But but when the things happens, uh, you just have to really devote day and night into it. Day and night into it. And that's why I'm glad my wife is actually here, so that I know all this missing night, what I was doing. <laughs> you know, the opportunity like that don't come very often. So when it, when it comes, you have to seize it. You have to do everything complete, but you have to do it fast. And that's why you have to train yourself all those times. And you don't have to do a damn thing. Put things into a bank. That's OK. You don't have to buy anything. But when opportunity comes, you have to jump on it. And that's what I did. When you finish all of the things, it doesn't take all that long, but you take intensive work for a short period of time. Yes? Do you, uh, do you normally find things on screen? Do you use other well, I like to read that one mostly because it's in itself is a good activity. I don't have to find anything. I learn. 
then I'm curious about all businesses. And that's why when opportunity can come, within a few seconds, you can tell. You can smell it. How can you really develop that smell? The only way to do that is just reading page after page. And value line is particularly good because it really puts you know, all sorts of different data and all sorts of, 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 of years in not just one year. And so that's the you know, easiest way for you to really learn a whole bunch of different businesses. Yes? So what percentage of your time did you put in it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to really keep that confidential, but a shitload of them. <laughs> okay, let's go back to, to a year and a half ago. Okay, so this is a fall. And, you know, this thing come from this book. I mean, this, you know, is, you know, this, you know, this is like a, you know, standard poor. Uh, well, you know, every, every, you know, every broker has a book in every country. Give you, you know, one page summary of every company. You know, it's just, you know, S&P has a book for U.S. companies in which I use, but I, I prefer to use value line, as I said, because of a U.S. company it just give you more information. And for other countries, they don't have value lines, you go with this. Okay, so I just flipping on that one at that point. You know, there's a one page, you know, jumps on, and so that's the page. So what uh, people can tell you about that page? Yes? Right. What do you mean by cheap? <laughs> well, if you really think about your, your owner, don't think about per shares, okay? So if you just train yourself from now on. Don't think about per share numbers. Think yourself as an owner. So give me, what is the market cap? Come on, that's simple. Come on. And I thought you guys all did homework, did you? Anybody did homework? Not a one hand. Raise your hand if you did homework. One hand. How the hell are you going to make in this business? One hand. You did it, John? Yeah. Good. Tell me, what is, your, uh, what is the market cap? <laughs> no, I, mean, uh, I found that it's quite difficult to understand the Korean company. OK. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> it's very simple. What is the ratio between Korean won and dollar? What? Yes, just divide by a thousand. So do that right now. What is the market cap? What? Eighty-seven million. Roughly about twelve dollars. Roughly about what? Five and a half million shares. How much is that? Don't use that one. Don't use you know use your kind of you know get used to if you want to read a lot of company you know there's a lot of a company this one. Okay, each page should take no more than five minutes, and the only way to do that is don't use those calculators. Just get yourself into more of a mental uh, little things. You can really look at those things, and immediately within five minutes, you get a pretty good summary of the basic financial data. So don't use all of that. Tell me the numbers. Twelve five and a half million. Okay, so sixty some million dollars. Give or take five ten million doesn't kill you. What is their earnings last year? Give me the kind of pre-tax number. Come on, you guys. You're the Columbia Business School class. You're the elite. You expect to make $150,000 a base. What do we people pay you for? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> How much is that? Give me the pre-tax earning. How much is that? <laughs> pre-tax earning? Just read a few lines before. It's called. What is the net income? Well, that's a six months. <clears throat> Double that, and the year before is what? 24 million pre-tax, 31 million. You're trading at a 60 million dollars of market cap, roughly about two times. What's your working capital? 
What's your book value? What is the book value? Come on. Come on, you guys have work to do. This is not good, Bruce. <laughs> I don't know what you're oh, teaching yeah, no, them. I think they're still dividing by a thousand, right? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, divide by a thousand. There's 236 million. It's simple. 230 million dollars in book. 60 million in market cap. 25 million net earnings and 31 million pre-tax earnings. How much is, what is the constitution of the book value? How do you really go about to do this? We have to probably go to the basics. OK, who can tell me how do you really do those things quickly? Just as, as an analyst, you know. Just. Just what, what do you say about it when people ask me, how do you really, within five minutes, tell me the basic sort of structure financially of this company? How do you go about Chase? Tell me. And? How much is it roughly? Contributed capital. So that's another 180 million or so fixed assets. Perfect. Simple. What do you use in businesses? You use some fixed assets and some working capital. That's it. And the goodwills, you can really not count on them. But that's it. That's what you need to operate a business. That's what you mean by owner. If you're owner, you look at something like that, you should be able to tell right away. And if you can't do this, well, that's Bruce's fault. <laughs> I shouldn't really fault you. I mean, that's the basic you, you would learn, right? OK. So now here is the basic thing you come out of this one. OK, so this one is not to give you a whole bunch of different information, right? It tells you roughly it's traded at $60 million in market cap. It has roughly about $30 million in pre-tax earnings. And it has about $70 million, roughly $180 million in fixed asset, come up with $240 or so million in book value. So what does it tell you? What do you do next? You look at that one, it took you five minutes, you got this one. What do you do next? What? Figure out why it's so cheap. How do we know it's cheap? We think it might be cheap, but you're not It's not conclusive yet. You have to, you have to go, to, you know, next to find out what exactly what is the earning, what is the book, what is the constitution, of the working capital, what is in the, in the uh, fixed. Right? Now, I'm just basically using common sense and common logic. I mean, this is something you have to really think. You don't have to go through a, any, you know, this is sort of a, you're still kind of a, you know, savable, if you will. If you, you know, that's why all my employee ever had really never went to business school and never worked for a uh, kind of establishment and management firm, and some of them never had accounting, because I find it's easier to train them than somebody who, who did. But clearly, it hasn't really demonstrated here. I mean, if you sort of go through, if they're teaching the right way, you should be able to tell right, right away what it is. OK, so we did some work, and it really takes enough, no time. Of the 70 million, in uh, current asset, you know how much is? It's all cash. Securities, tradable securities. Of 180 million, of the 180 million in so called fixed income, well, they recorded, they own 100% of a hotel. 
They recorded 30 million as a book. They also own 13% of a department store, which should record on the book of 30 million. It just so happened that department store is next page. So it's easy for me to find. I turn the page around, I find the department store. I discover it is roughly had a market cap of 600 million. So 13% roughly give me what? What? 80 million. Roughly 80 million. So the book really underestimated the <coughs> value by another 50 million. And they also owe three cable companies, <coughs> in the mid 10 percent ish. And they also read a whole bunch of real estate. And next, I look at that department store they look at. Boy, <laughs> it has exactly the same profile. They're trading roughly around the cash and security they own, about two, three times of their earnings. And they own a whole bunch of a different asset. Turn out they're the second largest cable operator as well. And the next thing I learned is this department store really functions more like a hotel. It's not a department store that we understand here. They don't take any inventory. They basically provide it's more like a shopping mall. And they charge it by taking a percentage off the top line of all the merchants sell their stuff there. OK, so you add it all up. Here is what you have. OK, you're paying $60 million. You have a $70 million in cash. This is no debt. $70 million in cash. You have another $100 million in stock. That's how much is that? $170 million. You have a $30 million as a hotel. The value hasn't been changed over the last 10 years. And real estate in Korea has gone up dramatically over that same period of time. I went to Korea and look at the hotel. I look at all their department stores. It looks quite decent to me. I check the recent transactions of all the things in the neighborhood. They all indicate me that value is more like a two, three, four times of what is on the book. But supposedly I take it on the book. Supposedly I take it on the book. Let's add another 150 million. How much we have right now? Roughly 320 million or so which I paid a 60 million. And besides, I have an earning of about $30 million a year. What did I miss? What did I miss? Yes? Good question. What about it? Any evidence of that <clears throat> could happen? Right. Terrific point. Absolutely a great point. Anything else? All your assets are also about 100 kilometers from a lunatic with a nuclear bomb, so that's not really something. Great point. Anything else? You could have governmental regulations that could hurt you. Like an example would be like Free Electric Power, which had uh, right. the government set you know, low prices where they had basically lost money. Right. Anything else? Even the lawsuit liability. What? The liability because of lawsuit, you know. What kind of a lawsuit? It could be a lawsuit from the customer or from the shareholder, or it could be from the uh, supplier. That could happen to any company, right? Yeah. Your reason that specifically for this company or any company? Any company. Okay. Anything else? Now, so far, I haven't heard anything about local market. As if the only guy who would really bother about those are foreign investors. What about the local market? What about what other investors are seeing and looking and thinking? Good point. Look at it. That's why I give it to you. I thought you're going to do it. Yes. Small market. What's that? Small market. Absolutely. And how much is it owned by the uh, insiders? 
Oh, you don't have to vary. It's about 50%. <clears throat> you've got a whole bunch of different things against you. You also have a whole bunch of different things that really in your favor. You have to go through all of it, each one, and think rationally, carefully. You have to add to that list of the attitude of the local investors, the other people who are buying, because there's nobody from foreign that really owns this damn thing, if you check that. So you go through all of that, <coughs> and we don't have time to go through all of that, <coughs> but you should. And then you'll come up with a solution. I mean, uh, uh, come up with your de decision, as I have. Now I sort of own it. And what happens to the stock uh, since? Well, again, nobody's have any computer or whatever you can check. You don't trust me. OK, <clears throat> so I'll have uh, two charts that, uh, that are printed out directly from Bloomberg. One is that, um, <clears throat> that department store. It was traded around to somewhere around 22. Last I checked, it went to about 100. And then <clears throat> this one, star was 12. Last I checked, it's around 70 something. Each went up about five, six times. Anyway, <clears throat> well, I give a couple of examples just to tell you that uh, this type of approach is not natural to an investor. It's not natural to you. However, if for whatever reason you come to the conclusion that you yourself, your personality somehow fit into this mutated gene pool, that this is something that you might really <clears throat> be looking to do, the only thing that I can add to that <clears throat> is that there's a lot of money in it. <laughs> as has been, I mean, repeatedly proved by people from Ben Graham to Buffett and everybody else. And I have been the probably just most grateful to this class, <clears throat> to Bruce, and um, actually many years before I came to business school, I took that class and it really changed me fundamentally. But one thing you do have to do is you got to do it. I mean, that's why I was somewhat disappointed of what, you know, the, the amount of work you have put into places. I tell you, I made hundreds of thousands of dollars just taking this class, just listening to the 14, 15 people. But it did a lot of work. I'm telling you, you can make a lot of money if you're really into this. Not only just listen, but do it. I mean, don't you guys, you know, how much you spend, you know, coming to school here? How much you spend? What is the tuitions, the board, and all of that stuff? What is it now? What? 70. 70 altogether? Well, you need at least to make it that up. I mean, you should at least make $70,000 back, right? And you also have a two years, you're not making anything. You gotta make that up. How do you make that up? This is a terrific way to do it. And so that's sort of kind of my last point I want to make is the only reason I've come back and really, so I don't really talk about our holdings anymore. This is actually, we don't hold any of those two stocks anymore. Um, the only way I, I do that is because all the, you know, when I came here prior to business school and, di and doing the business school, you know, most people still talk about names. And I benefit hugely, hugely just by listening and actually do it. That's the difference. And back then, that was more than you know, 10, 15 years ago. I made you know, roughly hundreds of thousands. In one stock, is more than 100,000. Back then, I think our cost was also a little bit lower than, than the 70, I think. I mean, it was, I can't remember what it was, but, but it was a lower. And, but, that's, but that's who you were into this class for. This class is different from any other classes because there's no bullshit theory. All everybody's telling you is what works, is what works. And if they don't tell you that one, well, ask them. They should. Well, <laughs> maybe they should, but I did. <laughs> okay. So that's 
So you sort of, you, you guys have a terrific opportunity. You'll be able to bid all the points that got into Bruce's class. And if you don't really use this thing, shame on you. You've got to do it. I mean, those are things, really, there is so much gold in it, that little pages, those little books, those value lines, all of them. You've got to use it. You've got to do it. I mean, you're young. You have energy. You know, What to lose? There's nothing to lose. Do you want to take questions? Yes. <laughs> yes, go ahead. What are some of the more common mistakes made in analysis? In analysis? What? In the research that you do. What are, what are some common pitfalls? In well, the, 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 the most com okay, so if you're an analyst, okay, I always tell my analysts, I only need two things from you. And if you want to be an analyst, and you need to be an analyst, of course, before you become a good investor, you want to provide accurate and complete information. Accurate and complete. Most people failed on both score big time. And you just have to go to that extra length in order to get it done. If you can't succeed on that one, you can't succeed, succeed in this business. Because most of the time, you're going to stand alone, basically against just about everybody else. And if you're not really confident about what you know, and you're confident about your prediction, what other people know or don't know, you can't possibly be putting that kind of a money when the thing's going into a free fall when it looks like you're really losing all your money, when everybody else is laughing at you, all the smart guys. So you must be able to first do accurate and complete. And the second thing, in this business, okay, most money are not made on those stocks I was just talking about. Your biggest amount of money you're going to ever make is not from that. Those are things that really get your bread and get your basic business going and give you the basic returns. They do not provide you outsized return. Even if both stock went up five, six times, they do not give you the outsized returns. If you're a value investor in the truest sense, okay, so there are two schools. I mean, you can do the Tweedy Browns, you can do the Ben Grahams, um, or you can do the Buffett and Munger type, which is <clears throat> more of kind of what I'm interested in. If you want to be that one, your return is going to come from a handful, no more than no more than number on the two hand, in your entire life of maybe 50 years of tremendous insight. Tremendous insight you're going to gain that no other people have. How do you really build that insight? There's no other way other than basically continuous curiosity, intense. Curiosity, continuous a study for your whole life. No, but I think what he was Anything asking, that works. What he was asking you is, in your career yeah. doing this kind of analysis, what particular mistakes would you make? You well, I, every time I failed on those are three scores, I made a mistake. Every time I didn't really get accurate information, I made a mistake. Complete information, I made a mistake. I, did not, I thought I had an insight. It wasn't insight. I made a mistake. Every time I failed on three scores, I made a mistake. And, and there are plenty. Specific example to well, on the big bet I ever made, I, I, I don't recall we ever made a mistake, actually, on the big bet. <laughs> <laughs> now, my biggest mistake, actually, is not making a couple of bets. The biggest mistake I made is that during the course of my career, that you know, I had a spectacular returns, but I couldn't raise any money. Because every time I go out to talk to people, people basically say, what the hell are you talking about? I want a monthly, I want a two weekly, I want a weekly returns. I want you to go up you know, in the down market. I mean, that's what I wanted. I want you to be a bank, except it yield better. Well, <laughs> and you were a hedge fund, aren't you? <laughs> so anyway, so, but that's, you know, I couldn't really, but in the end, I sort of, there was a couple, you know, a couple years, not long. I said, okay, I'll do some of those conventional stuff. I moved into Julian Robinson's.
you learn from the best practice of other hedge fund managers and, and somebody else kind of work on the uh, uh, shorting, all of that. You know, essentially sort of <laughs> useless things uh, it turned out to be. And I, I sort of busy myself with all sorts of different tricks. Because if you're in shorting, you just have to trade. There's no other choices. Because you know, your upside is 100%, your downside is unlimited. You have to trade. And so, so you really, you, and your, your, your mentality changes somewhat. You can't no longer really, you, you basically kind of put yourself into the in what, what, what Charlie says about <clears throat> kind of if you're doing things like that, it's just as if you, you know, bond your hands behind you in an ass kicking game or <laughs> something like that. It's true. It really is true. And that was the period of time that I probably have the biggest opportunity of company that I have absolute insight, management that I know, that are trading below cash, and it subsequently went up 50 to 100 times. And I missed it. I couldn't really bring myself into it. It doesn't really fit into this monthly, uh, all this shit. That was the biggest, biggest mistake I made. It's not how much money I lost, it was how much money I forgot. I, make, I lose money, of course I do. I do make mistakes from time to time. And usually, you made a mistake when you haven't really quite finished all your work, but you like it you know, enough, so it's a timber line, you know, at 28, I'll boss some. But I haven't finished all the work, and I said, on itself, the probability is with me. Um, and, but I added a lot, lot more after I finished the whole process. Well, sometimes, you know, as you're sort of finding more and more, you prove your thesis wrong, by then you lost 20, 30 percent. You sold it, okay? So you're wrong. Take the mistake, run, you know, move on. But Oz is with you. If you buy a stock at it with a sufficient margin of safety, the probability is with you. So if you do that long enough, uh, and with you know, a relatively smaller amount of bet, of course, you haven't known everything, then, then you're okay. You're not going likely to lose a lot of money. But if you cannot really bet on the things you know, and you know you have insight, no other people have it. And that's the biggest mistake. I cannot forgive myself for making that mistake. Are you going to tell them what that company is? No. Because <laughs> I still might have a chance to do that. <laughs> no, seriously, you go through your life, you may not have no more than five, ten insights. And you develop that one over many, many years of study. Some of the things I'm doing, really, I find myself doing that 15 years ago. I study the American company, and now I find the Asian counterpart. And I find the valuation that I like. I find I can really bet. But I study that business for 15 years in between. I know everything about that industry, and what really makes that business ticks. You need to have that kind of insight in order to really You can really swing with conviction. And if you cannot do that, either psychologically or because you're ill-prepared, you just will never really make any r real amount of money. I mean, you go through, you know, you do what Ben Graham does, what Tweedy Brown does. I mean, you're going to have your 10, 15 percent a year, and you're likely to do much, much better than most of the professional managers, the 95 percent of other people. But you're not going to make the outsized return that Buffett have have been able to achieve. And you may not have that opportunity throughout your life. Why should it be easy? Opportunity of that kind that gives you 100, 1,000, 10,000 times. Their biggest ideas really give them 10,000 times. Opportunity, if done once in your life, you're set. Why, that could be, why should that be easy? By definition, they're not. And you require a whole bunch of different factors to come together. You know, what really Charlie would have called it, what is the term of Lala? Lala Palosa. You've got all sorts of a different kind of a things working on the conscious level, the subconscious level, the psych psychological level, political, whatever. You've got a whole bunch of forces working together. You've got a huge wave behind you. And you are the one, you are the only one, who have the insight and is willing to bet. Back to buy it sound, complete, accurate information, and a huge insight. And that's what you are sort of really drives me in this business. It's exciting. It's utterly exciting. And you've got to learn everything. 
you know, my interest is just, you know, I started uh, with the physics, and the mathematics, and it got into economic history, law, politics. I like everything. I'm interested in everything. And that's what you needed. You might need models from biology. My wife has a PhD in biology, and actually, I, you know, I learned a lot from her over the years, and actually some of them helped my investment, except she didn't know. That's maybe why she's here to check in. <laughs> but anyway, so you gotta learn, you have to learn from everything. You have to be intensely curious about everything. And occasionally, you're gonna stumble into one big opportunity. Meanwhile, you still have plenty of things like, you know, the Timberlands, the Hyundai, you know, department store H&S. You're gonna find those opportunities from time to time. Give you a few times return. That's not bad. That's not bad. Yes. How many companies do you invest in a year? Depends. You know, there will be probably, there's averages are meaningless because the opportunities are different. You know, there might be years you don't really have a lot of opportunity. And then there might be years you have a lot of opportunity. It just sort of, it, it all depends on what really become available to you. But one thing I guarantee is, they don't really come in steady pace. I don't really have a steady kind of once a month, once a week type of idea. I never had that throughout my career. Back into the times, you know, when I started this thing 15 years ago when I was at Columbia, at the time I was an undergraduate student, when I bought my um, I think throughout of that maybe five, six years of when I was in school, at college, law school, and a business school, maybe I have maybe three, four big ideas that really pay off big. And, you know, how do you average that out? <laughs> and then afterwards, you know, I get a little bit better. You know, the things about this approach is you progressively get better and better and better. To the point you look at a page like that, it takes you, you know, a couple minutes to tell you right away whether something can jump out. You can smell it when you see something. So you get better and better and better. So you might actually have more opportunity. Or the market is just not cooperating, and you don't have a lot of opportunity, uh, good ideas a year goes by. That's OK. But I do not want to a whole year goes by, whereas I did not learn anything. I did not establish a good insight, or at least I thought it was a good insight, or destroy the insight I thought I had. You want to go through every day by learning something. It's a good mental discipline to have. And a year goes by, you have to learn a great deal. How do you find that first thing, your first thoughts when you were undergrad? Well, I wrote a book, <laughs> and it gave me uh, a little bit of, of uh, advancement. And uh, somebody paid a small amount of money and bought the movie right for that. And uh, but my negative, my net worth is a negative because you you have a whole bunch of borrowings, but I have cash. And so. That was pretty good, you know. On balance, you know, my net worth. I mean, is a cash is it just couldn't really offset the debt. But I do have cash, so I was very, very lucky in that regard. How do you allocate your time between searching for ideas, researching ideas, reading about ideas, and reading books on biology, law, physics? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say there's only two divisions. All of the things you list, that's all searching ideas. Okay, so when I read biologies, or when I read physics, uh, when I read history, which is really one of my favorite <coughs> things, it's all searching ideas. When I do business, and when I when I find an idea, I want to read it. But if I find an idea that are actionable, say if I kind of one of those things jumps out, that's all I do. Okay, if I don't have, I do the other one, and then the rest of the time is basically with my kid and my wife. <laughs> We've got two little one, little girls, one and a half and three and a half, and they're really just, you know, I learn from them too, because to see how human cognition really develop, which is enormously important. When you try to really figure out, you see, my checklist is, okay, is that cheap? Is that a good business? Who's running it? What did I miss? You know, I go through all the checklists. When I go to the, who did I, what did I miss? That is hugely important to understand psychology, to understand human cognition. And no other places is better than really observing how human develop those cognition from early on. And that's why actually, you know, playing with my two little girls really helped me tremendously as an investor. So I guess it's all work. 
anyway. <laughs> Anything. And in addition to all of that, I would also add one more thing. Okay, so you know, I said there's a three things that distinguish a value investor. Okay, so you've got uh, a business owner mentality. You have a different time horizon. You demand a huge margin of safety, but it's all come from one thing, which is sort of a, you're a business owner and you're a cautious business owner, and you can't control the outcome of the management, therefore you demand a compensation. It's almost self-defense of a margin of safety. And then because you're a business owner, you tend to be long-term, blah, blah, blah. They're all the same. Now, people would ask me, OK, if you're a business owner, OK, why the hell you double with the stock market? Stock market is not, is mean, is not mean for the business owners. It means for the people who can trade. That was the attraction of the stock market. That's why 95% would never buy into this idea. Because if everybody, supposedly everybody, this would never happen because of human nature, but supposedly 100% of the people all are you know, value investors, would there be a stock market? No, hell no. Who would buy IPO? We thought IPO, well, where does the stock market come from? Where does the secondary market come from? And if everybody demand a huge margin, why anybody would sell to you? So that's why I started the lecture by basically saying that you are basically you you are, you are not you do not belong to the stock market. And therefore, you have to always always understand that perspective, and therefore to position yourself properly, and don't get carried away. But if you really really truly a business owner, then you will be attracted naturally, sooner or later, into owning businesses. And that's why Buffett really left it. Munger left it. Each of them runs a partnership of 13 years, and they buy businesses, run a real company. Or if you're really kind of you know, into that money, eventually you become sort of private equity. But that's more like a real business, in a sense. But there was evolution. But as long as humans, I mean, a value investor with that kind of perspective would always find something to do, something profitable to do in the market that's not mean, that's not designed for them. One is that the people designed for are fundamentally flawed people. That basically they're attracted because they want to trade. And if you want to trade, you're bound to make a mistake. You're bound to really get your emotions carried over. There's a fear, greed, or whatever the other emotion in between. You're bound to make a mistake. And so when that happens, there will always, always be room for guys like you. You know, supposedly you are that kind of that five percent. There will always be opportunity for you. Okay. Yeah. What drives your decision to sell? What's that? What drives your decision to sell? That's a very interesting question. I I evolved over that question. I used to have a philosophy: if I don't want to buy at that price, I sell. That was used to be my philosophy. And I find myself evolving a little bit from that one because occasionally I find a business. A find an insight that I just like the business so much, I all of a sudden find myself being a real owner of basically saying somebody tried to attempt to really get me to sell because the price is very good. You know, the, the sort of is a, it's not something I'm willing to buy, put it that way, to that price. But my hunch is the probability is with me that over the next 10 years, better and better and better. And that's really the law of a distribution of good businesses. The leaders take a disproportionate amount of capital. And in certain industries, that advantage, that huge advantage, and that's when I really began to think, OK, so now you've got to do a different calculation. OK, you sell, and you may not be able to find another <coughs> opportunity to buy it back, and B, you have to pay 
huge amount of attacks. Because at that point, assuming you're right, you already accumulated a giant amount of attacks, which you have been borrowing from government interest free. Essentially, if you don't sell, you basically borrow, you're leveraging your position by a margin of 30% or something. I mean, in my case, it would be 50%. If you, by the time you add 12% in the st you know, state, all of the other stuff, it's like you know, 40 50%. So you're leveraging a position 40 to 50% interest free, and it's not caught upon, and it's indefinite loan from the government to you. And so if you can think, and the business will be able to deploy that capital at a return that are roughly, uh, you know, it's not even 15%. It's superb business, I usually find, is a 50 to 100% return on deployed deploy capital. And they were able to deploy that. Boy, that mathematics get very, very interesting very quickly. Now, the caveat for that one is you have to be confident, reasonably confident, to be able to project that long. And I would say there's only a, hun a handful of opportunities your entire lifetime, you'll be able to project that far off. If you're an investment banker, all you do is really project into infinity. And that's bullshit. You know it's a bullshit. Everybody else knows it's a bullshit. You don't know. You can't really project for the next day. How do you know you can really go to, you know, some shit for the next five years, and after another, another five years, and infinity, terminal value, all of that shit? It means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. However, I predict if you are good, if you spend your entire lifetime study, you might be able to come across over a course of a 50 years career, maybe five to 10 opportunities, in which you can confidently project with overwhelming odds next 10, 20 years. At that point, you don't sell. Why do you want to sell? You got a government really lending you money 40% compounded interest-free, and it would have never really kind of asked the money back. And you can really project, I mean, and the business is deploying the capital in the order of 40 to 100% a year, and also very tax efficient. And that's what you do. That's what you do. So in these two situations, I mean, what made you decide that you should sell Timberland and uh, HNS? Because they don't have that. None of the businesses really fit in that category. They're not that kind of business. I do have some business in my portfolio that really kind of belong to that category <clears throat> that I was just talking about. That's why I'm not talking about it. Can you describe generally what you look for in that particular? A business of, of that kind, <clears throat> you have to really look for this. You have to find that an advantage of the, the established over whatever the reason they establish is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. What would be some examples like that? Give me some examples. Somebody study this? Yes, give me an example. OK. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? Give me some examples. I mean, that's really where. Where that's sort of, you know, why the business school really kind of costs you this much. This is why. I mean, it's, you, you, you really get into the frame of mind, at least the habit, of thinking about those things. What really make one business more successful than the others? What is their advantage? Why they're making more and more and more and more money? And some is just doing less and really go up and down. Why is it? Have you discovered any business? And by the way, the only way you can find that is by studying the ones who are already established. Anthony, yeah. are you going to name Is it Anthony? Anthony? Oh. I'll say, you know, if you can sell an addictive product like nicotine. What was that? If you're Philip Morris and you can sell an addictive product and people are going to be addicted to nicotine for the next 50 years, you know, you're the strongest brand in the industry. There will be some people in the world that will buy your product. You know, it may not be in the U.S., but it might be in some places. Right. Yeah, that might be something where you look at what really make uh, Phyllis Morris uh, <clears throat> Marlboro more um, than the other brands? Well, they established their brand 50, 60 years ago. They were way ahead of everyone else. OK, that's a good one. Well, Kelly Monger had Coca-Cola. That's something that I really prefer, but. <laughs> Kelly Monger did Coca-Cola, and he said he's saying, great company. And he basically talked about both, what was the fact, where it had 
everything. Like, you know, you had an addictive product, you had parts that made people happy, you had products that was pretty cheap. And I can't remember what the other one was. But it had all these things where it was just an unassailable business, people really wanted it. And, you know, everyone in the whole world knew that it was, you know, a substitute for water. It was crazy. You know, he said back in 1870, you should be able to figure out how this business will be. And they also, yes. Any kind of like exchanges, like eBay or the commodities exchanges, that you get depth of liquidity when people use it. Like that. That's a good one. Trading agencies. Why is that? Um, because uh, you need credibility uh, for the financial market, and you're not gonna, you're not gonna be at any Anything else? Uh, the certain geographies of home roads is the only way to get somewhere. What's that? Anything else? Not trucking companies. You always need to transport goods. What? Trucking companies. They're always transporting goods. Yep. One, one type or another. Are you agreeing with all these? Just well, they're basically that. reciting the uh, portfolio budget. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the result has a great. <laughs> I don't think you need to, re to agree with that. The result have a great. Yes, I do agree with that. But I want you to really come on something that Buffett haven't bought, something that you think of, something that really sort of he's already. In other words, I don't want you to just get that one because you got a stand of approval from somebody who's really already firmly established as the reading agency value investor. Give me a name that he doesn't own, but also share those characteristics. Give me a name. Berkshire portfolio. OK, that's a good one. Why is that? You just oh, you're already kind of outlined. Cell yeah. Phone towers. What's that? Cell phone towers. Okay. What? Well, tell me why cell phone towers? Because once the carriers installed on it, it's too expensive to move. Mm -hmm. um, going to the rest of the building next year. Yep. And you've got zero or close to zero market level or maintenance capex to maintain the asset. Given all the reason why the tower companies all failed. Virtually all of them went through bankruptcy. No, two of them went through bankruptcy. No, they came out. American Tower. Close. That's a good one. One of my three companies was American Tower, but I was a student. That's a good one. Any other one? Yes. Quarry and it builds up areas. What? Quarry and it builds up areas. Quarry. A rock quarry. A rock quarry. Yeah. In the And it builds up area because you can't open any new quarries because you can't get planning uh, to do so. And you can't transport and port it far over land, you can't transport it in about a half an hour. So. Yep. A finite wine uh, mine, yep. In your stock exchange, what's the public? Mm hmm Go to what? Any other one? How about the ones that everybody use? Go ahead. Building materials company? What's that? Building materials? Why is that? Because people are always going to have to build. And it's a business that's going to be around definitely. And what about the competitors? How many of them are there? Millions. You answer my question. Anything else? Anything else? What do you use every day to do your research? What's that? Value line, okay. What else you use? Computer. Are you sure you use computers? There's millions of them. <laughs> Same with the booting materials. Capital what? Capital IQ. Capital IQ? <laughs> what? Good for you. Now, when Bloomberg was introduced, there was a bridge, the Reuters. Why they succeeded? Why Bloomberg succeeded? that they are very user friendly and you can perform a lot of different analysis with the user you are. And on top of that they have a lot of information. So you can pretty much track everything. The only thing is that they fail a little bit sometimes in the real time. Aside from that you can do everything. Good answer. Anybody else can come up with this one? Let's talk about Bloomberg a little bit because this is something you everybody use. Any other reasons you can think of? 
What? Maybe they, I mean, okay. Maybe they okay. Anything else? Um, I didn't hear what you guys said, so I'm glad you were seeing, but you know, as, it, as it gained size, then they were able to spend more money to, to add to more research, and then so like, that propelled like, their... What kind of research? <laughs> Anything else? They started, he was a partner at Solomon Brothers in the bond trading department, so their their analytics were far more detailed and far more okay. extensive than Deutsche. Okay. High switching costs. Why is high switching cost? Because um, the people who use the machine have a high um, opportunity cost of their time. It takes a long time to learn all the functionality of Bloomberg. For all the answers I heard, this is the best answer. All of the things you talk about is true. But this is really the most important reason. This is why that there will be a moment, there will be in any businesses, I want to read this example is because it's really you know, virtually all business you observe, not all of them really went through this dramatic example, but they all went through similar type of an example of transformation. And sometimes something has just happened in a certain industry that if you really went through different industries, you can almost tell where that outcome is going to come out. This is why you got to study. This is a fabulous case study of how you know a company really come from nowhere, going into an industry that already have a number of established, long established uh, players, and somehow really began to make an inroad little by little, and at a certain point crossed a milestone point. After that, they become a monopoly. Where is the British? Where are the Reuters? They're gone. They're gone. Partially because, partially because at a certain point, exactly as you said, at a certain point, anything that is hard to learn, that is highly, highly, you uh, highly, highly kind of relied upon to do your daily work. Once you learn that damn thing, you do not want to learn that again. And besides, everybody else using the same thing. You have to be able to communicate with your partners, with your colleagues, anybody you collaborate with. The business, the winner takes all. Now, how do you really get to that point is an interesting question. But supposedly you have an opportunity to observe how this industry evolved early on. Supposedly you really observe and see at a certain point they have crossed that line. Maybe it is the time when they really introduce them to every business school. So that, you know, when you graduated, okay, so you say, okay, I have this one available cheaply to me. I'll learn this thing. But once I graduate, go into the world, I don't want to learn that again. And everybody else is using that. Whatever is the time, there will be a time that that line has been crossed. And supposedly there is a public company. Supposedly you have a developer of that insight. That insight worth a shitload of money. That's the kind of insight I was talking about. And that is a virtual monopoly business. And you find that again, 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 in all sorts of different business. This is not alone. Why Microsoft succeeded? Brilliantly over Apple. When Apple was 100% of a market share at the time when they came in. But little by little, they crossed that line. So that when you debate between Apple or, or Microsoft, I say, OK, I learned this thing because I have to go to work. And all the company that I want to go, they use. I don't have a choice. Do you even have a choice today of not using Bloomberg? What is the cost of Bloomberg? What is the cost? Anybody know? It's just Nothing. You can almost call that zero. They put some cost because they pay themselves very well. What do they do? Do they do research? They don't do any research. What do they do? They come to visit you periodically, almost every month, and ask you, what do you use? on a daily basis. You're a trader. You're 95% of the people. You're you know, superstitious. 
I mean, if there's certain numbers works for you, I look at that number all the time. I develop a software for you, only for you. How many functions Bloomberg has? Tens of thousands. Does Bloomberg have a menu? Hell no. They don't want to give you a menu. They want to get you individually hooked on the two, three, four, five, five, six things. And they can charge on you. Use that every day. You're in the business. Every trade can really mean millions of a gain or loss. So you don't care to pay them $30,000 a year. And if they really charge you 10% every year more, you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. And they keep coming back to you because they know you're a trader. You're going to look for different things. And so they continuously to provide you the surface. And therefore, you're hooked and hooked and hooked. You're hopeless. <laughs> you're absolutely hopeless, beyond repair. Meanwhile, they would never give you a menu. They would never let you know the cost. It's not a cost of plus model. That's why it's a fabulous business. Fabulous business. And they make each one of you individually hooked to one product, which costs them nothing. And to the point they can really dictate and bully their suppliers, they pay them nothing. All they have is softwares to get you hooked. And who gave them that information? You. They don't even do research. They come to you. What do you need? I give that to you. Think about a switching from that. Think about a competitor coming up with another product. That each individual, you know, we're talking about 100,000 professionals. Individually, in 100,000 different ways. How do you compete? How do you compete? I don't know what do you really, why you use that for. I don't know. There's no menu. Now, supposedly you know that. Supposedly it's a public company. Supposedly you know the moment of inflection point. Do you want to invest? I would. That's what I mean by insight. Okay? You study every business, every business, I guarantee you. They all going through up and down in terms of the result as this one. But they all have more or less this type of a dynamics. Your job as a good financial analyst, as an investor, as a value investor, as a business owner, is to study that business all the time and observe those trends. And once in your life, maybe years, you'll be able to come up with opportunity like that that is actually available, unlike Bloomberg. Now, he's in that position of a selling, Alex. He doesn't want to sell. Why does he have to need to sell? They always have a huge premium price. They will always, always be 30 times earnings. But hell, he'll lose a whole bunch of a lot every time he wants to sell. He doesn't need to sell. That's when I really began to evolve with my philosophy from if I don't buy or sell into something that I just said. When you have things like that, you don't need to sell. You don't need to sell. Any other questions? Oh, sure. Any, whatever questions, yeah. After you making your investment, right? How involved are you with the business and the management? Well, the question, by the way, is after making the investment, how involved do you get with the management? Well, it's all different, you know. I've made a whole bunch of private investment. I serve as the chairman of two of them, I'm on the board of several, including Capital IQ. You know what? When we build a Capital IQ, we intentionally copied the <coughs> Bloomberg business model. And I'm really building another model that really copied the same one for the engineers, basically. Any high professionals that need to that kind of thing. So you know, you know, all the insight you learn can be applied for different businesses. In that case, I'm very active. Of the board, a lot of the time, I'm the largest shareholder. 
and a lot of other ones. You know, this Hyundai department store, <laughs> I couldn't even get a call. I couldn't even get a receptionist to really take my call. I went to there and visit everything. Uh, I saw all the properties, but couldn't get anybody to talk to me. But by and large, I like to know as much as I can possibly know. I want to be with the friends. You know, there's a Timberland situation. We become such a great friend, the CEO of the Sun actually become my investor. So that's the kind of relation I want to have. Opportunity. But you always try. You always try. Because just that uh, everyday business decisions, you can learn, you can observe, you would know the dynamic of that particular industry at that particular moment. And nothing is constant. That's the interesting thing about business. Nothing is constant. And that's why I have to keep relearning things. The things you sort of you concluded, you know, the ones, the analysis we just went through with, with uh, Bloomberg, maybe a couple years is different. I don't know what would cause the difference, but it could be. And I have also there observed, you take an example of Microsoft, the dynamic is different. It's no longer the same. Now you've got a free software. It poses a completely different scenario. Every business is constant. All sorts of different things could cause that change. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's why people who is active mind and really actively prepared and have the psychological temperament to be able to act when he really sees inside an opportunity would always, always have a chance to be fabulously rich. Oh, that's a good note to end on. And that's the note. <laughs> <laughs>